Hi everyone, uh, thanks for having me here. It's really exciting to be here. What a great venue. Um, so yeah, my name is Ben Stufford. I work for this company called, called Confluent. Anyone ever heard of Confluent? <laughs> <laughs> we do other things other than coffee, but oh, um, yeah. Anyone heard of Kafka? That's often more popular. So Kafka is a messaging system which was originally spun out of LinkedIn and is now kind of a, a slightly wider streaming platform. Um, so I work for this company. I actually work as an engineer um, on the core product, which is um, the distributed log. And uh, today I'm going to be talking to you about yes, yeah, streaming, um, uh, streaming with, with, with Kafka and its streaming engine, which is built in. Um, and we're going to talk about some kind of use cases which some of our customers use um, for IoT devices. So Kafka is actually a streaming platform. Um, what that really means is, at the core, is you have like a, what is essentially a messaging system. Um, it's a very scalable messaging system, but it is a messaging system. So you can kind of put data in and out of this, of this messaging system, and you can use connectors to connect it to a variety of different other sources you might be interested in. So, for example, you might push data in over something like MQTT, and then you might push data out into a database of your choice, so Mongo or Cassandra or Postgres. And then kind of the, one of the, the sort of more interesting components from my perspective is this streaming engine which sits on top. Um, and that allows you to basically um, process data in real time, bring different data sets together. So maybe the output of a variety of different devices, bring them together, correlate them in real time, and uh, add uh, computations to that. So this is a kind of typical architecture. There's a number, we will go through a, a variety of different use cases quickly, but this is something that we see quite, uh, quite, quite a lot. So you've got a lot of devices, and effectively you're using Kafka as a buffer. Um, so you're getting that data on site into a big buffer where you can have a very large number of connections into it. And then from that, you'll push it either through a streaming pipeline or a batch pipeline and into a serving layer. And this is sometimes termed the Lambda architecture. Um, so we can land, we can have any number of devices, we can land them into Kafka, which is effectively applying this buffer, and then we either stream or batch into some serving layer. So we apply our, our analysis techniques and then serve from there. So Kafka itself is a thing called a distributed log. Um, that's to say it's a real kind of distributed platform. So a log is a type of durable messaging system um, if you, you may have used other types of messaging system, maybe AMQP ones, JMS, um, things like ActiveMQ, uh, Rabbit, etc. Kafka is a little bit different because it's really a distributed log. That is a very simple idea, but it's quite a powerful one. So effectively, what, when messages are taken into Kafka, they are literally appended onto the end of a log. You can think of a log a bit like a file, except you don't rewrite it every time. You just append to the end of it. And this works quite, this is quite a powerful abstraction for messaging. Because if you want to read messages that are in the log, all you actually need to do is, all you need is a pointer. So you have a pointer, so George is at this point, and you jump to that point, and then you just start scanning from there. So this might seem incredibly simple, um, and is actually in many ways incredibly simple. So if I read some data, I effectively will jump to that point, scan, read some messages, go away, process them, come back again, jump to another point, scan. So all I need is basically a log and then this, this, this offset which tracks my progress. This works very well at uh, big, data, sort of big data workloads because of this fact that all of this access is sequential. Um, that makes it very inefficient. So you can, have, you can use uh, pretty much any variety of disk. You're not, limited to, for example, SSDs, as you would be often if you want performance of a B-tree-based uh, solution, which is what most messaging systems are. So that's kind of the core concept of the log. You can then scale that out. So much like something like Cassandra or sharded MongoDB, you, Kafka will shard data across a set of different machines. So we call them partitions. And this has this quite nice property that allows you to scale out linearly. Um, each partition is then replicated onto another machine. So if I write data to one partition, it will be on machine A. It will be replicated over to a partition on machine B. This has the nice property that should a machine fail, 
it will, uh, the system will automatically fail over to another machine, so you can kind of get this always on system. And um, it also has the advantage that we don't have to f-sync, so we don't have to flush every message to disk if we want to, to, to ensure durability guarantees. That's actually, actually also a pretty big advantage. So the result of this is you get this kind of linearly scalable architecture. But importantly, it's linearly scalable at all three layers. So I can have any number of kind of inputs, devices, or whatever writing into Kafka. I can scale out the broker itself linearly by adding more machines. And I can rebalance data if I need to. And I can actually have any number of consumers. And one of the sort of unique things about this is that you can um, a single, we call them topics, so a single channel, as it were, can be spread over a very large number of machines. So for example, it's not uncommon to have, um, I think one of the largest I've seen is, is about 100, uh, 100 terabytes in a single topic. And that's processing at a rate of about uh, 60 or 70 terabytes a day, um, which is kind of a lot for one, one topic. And as locality is often important, um, you can join these clusters together by replicating into different regions. So that's kind of a, a quick overview of how the technology works. So we've talked about this piece in the middle. Um, and we're going to talk about briefly about a few different use cases, and then we'll, we'll talk a little bit about streaming. Streaming is quite nice from an IoT perspective, because it, as a paradigm, although it, it does apply to a number of different um, use cases, it fits very well with IoT use cases. Um, right, so some real world stuff. So I talked about this one. This is kind of the canonical one. So if you are a mobile phone manufacturer and you were wanted to measure um, uh, people opening and closing applications on your phones and then maybe measure whether or not those applications crashed, then you could do that. And you, if you wanted to do that, you'd have to land what is actually a very large data set from a very large number of devices somewhere and then do some analysis on that. And uh, that kind of, uh, at the scale of a mobile device, you've obviously got a very large, you know, potentially billions of active users, so these are very large data sets. So that's that kind of core canonical pattern. Um, a lot of things look a bit like this, but are often used in slightly different um, uh, domains. So this is another one. This is actually a UK-based firm, um, Connected Homes, which span out of British Gas. Um, so they use it to um, ingest all the data from uh, their heating controllers. So these come in. It's a much lower uh, request rate, so around uh, 10,000 um, per second. Uh, and they actually have, a, they have a, a proprietary edge stack. They actually land that data into Kafka, so it's kind of acting as a buffer initially. And then, then that gets pushed into another data center where they do their analysis. Again, so this is effectively a landing zone uh, using this Kafka messaging system and then uh, replicated to a analysis system where they do sort of streaming and batch analysis. Um, cars is another example. Um, quite a few car manufacturers um, use Kafka again to apply this uh, a is a sort of landing zone, but also actually as a buffer to push data out again. Um, so here you've got uh, a mobile application, you've got a device um, inside a car, and you effectively have APIs between the two, and you can push data in this direction. So typically you use a, a custom API, well, often to get, it, um, to, get uh, to manage this connection, but then you will buffer data inside Kafka to push data, to push data out to these remote devices. So this works well when connectivity is not great. Um, so we can actually extend that example of effectively buffering, because you can, so I didn't really say that, you can buffer for effectively pretty much forever um, in most, for most workloads in Kafka because of that, the, the distributed log being the, uh, the underlying data structure. So a sort of more extreme example of this is shipping. Shipping's actually, a, in some ways, a relatively backwards field. Um, but surprisingly, there's a lot of interest in, in IoT in, in this particular industry, both on the sort of leisure side, cruise ships, et cetera, as well as on um, things like containers. So for example, it's actually, when you put a container on a ship, you have like 
you literally have no way of knowing where, how it's, good, where it's going to end up for sure. Like, there's no way of actually tracking it. You're just going to have to hope it gets there. Um, but again, we'll, we'll be with the, the products. So in this case, you can connect to the internet when you're, um, when you're docked. Otherwise, you're actually going through a very low bandwidth connection um, via a satellite. Um, so you can imagine that a ship which has a bunch of systems on, on, um, inside it, and they use a set of databases, needs to be able to synchronize with the cloud. Um, so again, you can use Kafka to kind of buffer this. So in this case, you've actually got effectively, you've got a database and you can replicate that to Kafka and then it basically just resyncs with the cloud when, when, it, when, it, uh, uh, when there is a, a high enough bandwidth connection. Um, motor racing. This is a completely different use case to both the cars and shipping. So in motor racing, you have, um, what actually happens is a truck turns up at the, uh, at the track, and on that it has a small data center and some analysts, and they actually connect to the cars via um, an RF uh, protocol. And um, effectively, that, that protocol dumps mess, so they have obviously a very large number of sensors on a racing car, and these kind of get dumped into Kafka and then analyzed um, in a streaming fashion so that they can obviously feed information back to the pit around what's uh, to help the, the, uh, the racing drivers make better decisions. All of that data then gets shipped back to HQ where they do further analytics after the race. And then finally, healthcare. Um, so this is a bit more autonomous and a little bit more offline. Again, you're sort of collecting data from a variety of different devices. It's normally a little bit more heterogeneous, and uh, you obviously have a number of different um, uh, sort of hospitals where we'll be amalgamating set, sets of data which, again, need to be processed. So, um, so, what's we, so, we've got, so we have the, this kind of architecture uh, where we can sort of ingest data and then do things with it. So, so the next question is, what do we actually do with it? How do we do something useful with these um, streaming data sets? So I just wanted to do a little introduction to stream processing. Anyone work on stream processing? Um, got a few. Okay. Uh, so yeah, it's stream processing is um, it's a bit it's very similar in many ways to the way that you use a database. So if you can, if you understand how you use a database, you execute a query against the database. It's a very similar concept. You're applying some function to a set of data. In a database, it's a static set. It's just there. You throw a query at it, and it provides, it does the computation, and it returns you the results. It's basically the same kind of concept, just on data that's moving, data that's in flight. So you're manipulating a set of streams. So you can think of it a bit like a machine, and you might have data coming in from a set of different sensors, and you want to apply some kind of correlation. So this is effectively an infinite data set because the stream will kind of go on forever. If I have a bunch of sensors, they're just going to constantly be emitting values. So to reason about that, I have to use a window. So I take an infinite stream. I, to, to, to be able to apply some kind of computation, I need to, ch I need to chunk it up into windows of some fixed time. So windows basically bound a computation. So let's say I have some function that uh, maybe counts the number of times that an application crashes on a mobile phone, then I would maybe have a metric which says number of, case, number of application crashes per minute. And I would do that by basically doing a windowed computation. But this concept of buffering is actually quite important because so windowing and buffering are slightly different, but I've kind of amalgamated them together because it's easier to understand. Um, so you can imagine if I have two different streams, so maybe I have um, a stream of applications being opened and closed and a stream of applications crashing, then I might want to correlate those two things together, but obviously they wouldn't necessarily turn up at the same time. So this is the concept of a join. I'm joining two data sets together, but they may, the, the things, the, the, uh, the events that actually correlate and need to be joined together arrive at different times, T3 and T7. I want to be able to join those things together inside a window. That's the sort of thing a, a streaming engine does. So we have a number of streams that come in, and the format is some computation, just like a, a SQL statement in a database, over some temporal window. 
and emitting at some frequency. So I might have um, the average, uh, yeah, so the, the average number of application crashes per minute, and I might emit that, let's say, every five seconds. Um, Kafka has a streaming engine built in. It's just an API. You can run it as a big streaming platform if you want, or you can literally just embed it inside a program that you write yourself. And that type of streaming engine is slightly different because it's, it's called a stateful stream processing engine. Stateful stream processing engines are different because, unsurprisingly, they're stateful. And what that really means is that they have like, little databases embedded inside them. And uh, this is quite useful because it allows you to have the concept of a table. So not only do you have a stream, you also have a table. So to, to, to define what that actually means in technical terms, a stream is an infinite thing, which I bound with a window. Right, so I only can consider a window of computation at any one time. A table is actually effectively a stream that goes back to the origin, that, that goes uh, effectively on forever in, in historic terms, but has this concept of a primary key. So just in the same way as a database table has a primary key, and when you insert a new value of a key, it kind of throws away the old one. That's, that's what a table does. Um, that's a bit abstract, but I've got an example in a minute. So you put all this together, and you have something like the Kafka Streams API. This is a stateful stream processing engine. Data comes in, gets landed into Kafka. We want to do something useful with it. We have the ability to, to apply a query. Um, so we have a process here with some business logic. Um, we have a query which we're going to effectively continuously compute over a window. And then we have this inbuilt kind of database which helps us deal with problems like buffering and joins and those kind of things. And output out of this becomes hopefully something more useful. So just to apply streaming to this particular use case, the, uh, the racing one, um, a simple streaming example would be uh, you might take an average of the, uh, the thread temperature. The thread temperature is the temperature at the bottom of the tread. And um, if that goes above 140 degrees over a one second window, then I might want to send an alert because we might want to uh, change the tires or correlate it with some other event. In a stateful stream processing mo model, I can also use the concept of a table. So in this case, um, I might want to correlate this with the lap time. So I might have a table. You can imagine I have a table where I map different drivers to their previous lap times. So it's a very simple table, which will be constantly updated. And I can then join this stream, which is the average tread temperature. Uh, and I can join that to this previous lap time. So only if the previous lap time is less than 85 seconds and the tread temp temperature is higher than this value will I emit an alert. That's kind of how streaming works. So streaming platforms are um, uh, typically built, built on a distributed log. That's not ubiquitous, but pretty much ubiquitous, um, which is quite nice because it's fault tolerant and linearly scalable. Um, you can store data in the logs. Unlike a traditional messaging system, you can literally use it as a, as a, as a, as a store for your data where you can stream things out. Um, hundreds, up to hundreds of terabytes in a single topic and you can buffer from a few hours to effectively indefinitely, not quite, but yeah, to most intents and purposes, infinite retention. Um, and then stream, the final piece is stream processing, which is computations based on windows, enrichments based on this concept of tables, um, all of the durabilities of Kafka. And th those, um, so Kafka's stream processing engine, it's called Kafka Streams, is JVM based. You are basically stuck on the JVM. Um, there is a thing called KSQL in beta, which we released recently, um, which allows you to basically interact with it in the same way as you would interact with a relational database by basically issuing SQL at uh, an engine. Yeah, so that's kind of a, a brief summary of that field. That's all I had to, had to uh, what I wanted to talk about today. But thank you all for listening. Thank you. <laughs>